Welcome to Y-Lab, the makerspace located in the basement workshops of the historic David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, and where those three telescope domes on the roof of the building on the right of the picture are like the world's largest shell game, because only one of the three has a telescope in it, and you have to guess. These are lessons 9 and 17 combined into one, where we cover antenna connections and SWR, which is not swearing. We'll learn about that. A lot of memorization in this section. Go for at least 80% on the quiz. Uh, go through it three times. You'll probably do way better than 80%, but don't stop till you've gone through three times to help remember things. Ham operators love antenna. They come up with all kinds of creative things. There is still a lot of engineering and science in antenna, new discoveries and things like that. The biggest thing about it is it's the best bang for the buck. You lose a lot on cable. You lose a lot of signal on uh, bad antennas. You put a good antenna on a cheap radio and you can really multiply your range and improve your signal. You can also design an antenna so you're concentrating the power on a particular frequency or in a particular direction. So normally an antenna will transmit all around. A good antenna design will focus the signal so you can get a lot more range, both for transmitting and for listening. You can also save a lot of space with clever designs. And it's subject to a lot of experimentation and when you get into a lot of the fun of amateur radio. Basic antenna principles. If you look at this ridiculously simple diagram on the right of the slide, that straight line in the middle is the antenna. So the signal goes out along the length of the wire, not along the tips. The signal radiates all around the wire. Now, here's something really simple. If the wire is vertical, it's called vertical polarization. And the power goes out equally in all directions. So vertical wire, vertical polarization. If the wire is horizontal, then it's horizontal polarization. And the transmission is better to the sides because of that thing called ground underneath the radio. You will get better reception if you match your send and receiver antenna polarizations, which means if you've got a vertical antenna for transmitting, you want a vertical antenna for receiving. Now, you will still receive if your antenna is horizontal. It just won't be quite as good. So, you know, your handheld, people will hold it sideways. They'll hold it upside down. Hey, it still works. And that wire is called the radiating element. And that's important because we're going to see some designs that have more than one wire. So the wire that the radio is actually connected to is the radiated, radiating element. How long should an antenna be? Well, that's all based on your wavelength and the speed of light. So we want an antenna that's optimal for the 50 megahertz band. Then we need to know what its wavelength is at 50 megahertz and plan the antenna around that. So if you remember from some of the earlier sections, our speed of light is 300 million meters a second. 50 megahertz means 50 million cycles or wave in a second. So 300 million meters divided by 50 million waves means a wavelength of 6 meters. So 6 meters would be the ideal length for that antenna. However, again, a quirk, as we discussed in an earlier lesson, if we're below 30 megahertz, use 286 million instead of 300 million meters per second for your calculation. Now, we had this thing called harmonics in the earlier lessons, where uh, it's a multiple of a base frequency. So a half length antenna or a quarter length antenna will also still work because of the harmonics. They just won't be as efficient. But on the other hand, you may not have room for a 6-meter antenna. So this way you'll get away with a 3-meter antenna or a 1.5-meter antenna. So the most basic antenna 
for efficiency, simplicity, uh, especially on HF, is a half-wave dipole. So the full length of the antenna is half-wave, so you have two quarter-wavelength wires separated by an insulator. Now there are a lot of variants to this to handle multiple frequencies. And so you'll get multiple wires on each side of the dipole having different lengths. You'll get traps, which are a combination of a coil and a capacitor along the length to help adapt to different frequencies. And, uh, but adding those different wires and the traps have a disadvantage in that you'll be wasting some power by generating harmonics on the signals. So it won't just be the, trans the, the wavelength you want. You'll also have transmission on some harmonics that can cause interference and things like that. And most importantly, you're wasting some of your power. Other tricks for antennas. So that was a really basic one. Remember, we said the wire we hook the power to from our transmitter is called the driven element. Could be more than one. Again, on a dipole, we have two sides to it. Now, we can add other elements that don't get the power, but kind of help reflect and direct the signal. These are known as parasitic elements. And the most famous and most popular with ham operators is the Yagi Uda antenna. By two Japanese inventors, Mr. Yagi and Mr. Uda. And Mr. Uda gets the short end of the stick because everybody knows it as a Yagi. So looking at the picture at the bottom, our transmitter will be hooked up to the two pieces in the middle. So that's like it's a mini dipole and it's a half wavelength dipole, which means each side is one quarter of the wavelength. And this is typically the type of antenna you'll see up on a big ham tower. And you can rotate it because this antenna focuses the signal in a particular direction. So behind the driven element that has the power, you can have one or more reflectors. And ahead of it, in the direction that you want to transmit, you've got one or more directors. It's a whole science to how long these reflectors are and directors are and what the difference is, or the distance is between them and our driven element. And so we can have multiple, but in general, it will always look like an arrow with the further away the reflectors are from the driven element, the longer they are, and the further away the director elements are, the shorter they are. Now, you can stack a couple of Yagi antennas and double your gain. Why do I say that? Because it's a question on the test. And the more director elements, the more reflector elements you put on your antenna, the more gain you get. Now, that'll start to decrease in value as you put more and more. But again, if you're trying to optimize your signal, get the most distance for the best bang for the buck, this will help. Now, you don't have room for a long antenna. So if you're trying to transmit, say, on the 20 meter band, you need 14.3 meters. Now remember, how did we calculate that? We're below 30 megahertz, so we use 286 million meters per second divided by 20, which gave us 14.3 meters. That's pretty long. Your backyard is probably shorter than that. So half and quarter length wavelengths will also work, but again, because of harmonics, they won't be as efficient. Those antennas, because of the harmonics, will also be good for direct multiples, like 40 meters and 80 meters. Now, a neat trick that they'll do is shape the antenna, so it doesn't have to be out there in a straight line. So, Here's three designs that we're only mentioning here because they're on the test. We're not going to go through a lot of the information you want if you want to build these. You know, get the reference manual we suggested. But here for the test, a cubic quad is shaped like a square. And the total length 
of all sides in the square is one wavelength. So each side is a quarter wave. Now, is it vertical or horizontal polarization? Good question, and it's going to be on the test. If your power is hooked up to one to a vertical side, it's going to be vertical polarization. If your power is hooked up first to a horizontal side, it's going to be horizontal polarization. Another design is the delta. That's a fancy word for triangle. Again, all sides of the delta add up to one wavelength. Each side is a third of wave. And we don't even ask about polarization for this antenna. Another design is a folded dipole. So we just make like a little tent out of it. It's generally a half wavelength antenna, just like our Yagi, remember that? So each side is a quarter wave. And it gives you wider bandwidth than the dipole. SWR, standing wave ratio. Standing wave ratio, you're going to have meters for this on, the ra on your radios or on your antenna tuners. You're going to have readings for this on antenna test devices, which used to cost thousands of dollars. Now you can buy for under a hundred bucks and it'll fit in your pocket. So SWR is a ratio. It's a measure of power transmission efficiency between your transmitter and your antenna. So it's how much of your power is getting out from the antenna, like being radiated. And if it's not all being radiated, what happens? It doesn't disappear magically. It bounces back to your radio. And your radio is built to handle that, built to handle a certain amount of it. And so the SWR is the ratio of transmitted to reflected voltage. Okay, so it's a voltage measurement, not a current measurement. And if you've got one-to-one -one as your SWR ratio, that is awesome. It pretty much means everything you're transmitting is going out the antenna. That's perfection. Anything below two to one is still considered very good because you're going to be varying your frequency. The length of your antenna is not perfectly matched. Otherwise, you'd have to have a different antenna for every little frequency change. So we generally try to use an antenna that keeps us at two to one uh, for whatever frequencies we want to transmit on. Okay, so do we want an antenna for each frequency? Uh, I'm sure there are some hams would like that if they have a big enough backyard and a big enough budget. But any given antenna will work best for its design frequency or sometimes frequencies and for the harmonics of those frequencies. That's the ideal situation. You got one antenna that can work a few and can work some harmonics. So, you know, get a good antenna and you'll handle 20, 40, and 80 meters. Now, it'll work less efficiently for other frequencies, but it doesn't mean it won't work. So you're going to have power reflected back. That's the SWR stuff. And you measure that with an SWR bridge. Uh, you may remember from our introductory session of the class, a bridge is just an old name for a meter used to be called a Wheatstone Bridge, the first time people did that little dial that goes back and forth. So we measure it with the SWR meter, and that reflected power has to be absorbed. It has to go somewhere, and your antenna tuner will handle that for you. And every time you change major frequencies, the bands, uh, you're going to retune for your SWR. Now, Modern radios, the best rigs, all do it automatically. An old rig, you can buy an antenna tuner and put it in front of it, and it will hand it automatically. And by in front of it, I mean not sitting on the shelf in front of it, uh, but sitting between your transmitter and your antenna. And again, if you're starting to test for a new antenna, first thing you do is test everything with a dummy load. 
you try to have manners and not blast the air with your silly equipment tests. The dummy load is a big resistor you hook up instead of your antenna and it'll absorb all the power. You don't want to be doing transmission without either an antenna or a dummy load attached. Now, your transmitter to antenna connection. This is one of the more esoteric concepts of radio. Uh, and as far as the tests are concerned, and for most users, you just got to make sure your impedance matches and it's a number. The impedance is a characteristic of electrical circuits, of wires, and of your antenna. And if it matches, it means the power will go through efficiently and you're not going to have a lot of reflection back if everything matches. So what are you matching for impedance? Your transmitter, your cable, your antenna. And if they don't match, you can get a transformer to match it up. You're also going to match for the cable and connection type. And we generally have two types of cable. Unbalanced is coaxial cable, which is usually 50 ohm or 75 ohm impedance. And uh, the center wire in that cable is the ground. If you cut open a coaxial cable, you'll see a wire in the middle, plastic wrapped around that, and then like a wire mesh around that, and then your black insulation around that. That center wire is your ground. A balanced line is like a, looks like a ladder line, two wires with some plastic segments in the middle, and that has a higher impedance, 300 ohm or 600 ohm. So it's hot wires separated by an insulator. You can switch between the two with a device called a balen for balanced, unbalanced. And that's it. Remember that. If you're going to go from balanced to unbalanced, you need a balen. Basic question in the test. And if the impedance doesn't match, you need a transformer. Now, oh, this is a fun one. Antenna and cable connectors. So we talk about these wires, we talk about the connectors, we talk about the antennas, all optimized to minimize your SWR, so you've got that nice one-to-one -one ratio. Then you're going to have connectors in between. And there are lots and lots and lots of different types of connectors. The big things you want to remember for the test is you want to seal them up to prevent water getting in. You also want to remember they're going to compare connectors. You can try memorizing them. You can go to a study guide. But generally for the test, a bigger number usually means a better connector. We'll get PL259, things like that. And then SMA is the smallest connector. That's one that typically you have on your handheld radios for antenna. So it doesn't mean SNA, but just SN, it doesn't mean small, but think of SMA as small for handheld radios. And so it's probably the worst connector of all for uh, efficiency when you're hooking up the cables. Safety stuff. Your antenna needs to be high enough that it can't be touched from the ground. And it probably needs to be higher than that. This is a critical, critical safety issue. Okay. The coating of the meat sack, that's you, cooks really, really well. The eyeballs cook even better. They are the most vulnerable. And so if you have your antenna just at your height or a little above that, it is perfect for cooking the most sensitive part of your body. Simple as that. Remember that for the test. Coax versus ladder line. Coax is insulated enough to be buried. And that has to do with the nature of the coax itself. Um, everything for the signal is uh, inside the cable. You've got, remember, the center is your ground. The uh, signal is transmitted on the mesh that's around it. Uh, but all that's isolated inside the cable. The ladder line you have the two wires and you have segments between it and then there's air in there as well. 
that air between the segments is an insulator between the segments and it uh, it has a characteristic it affects the impedance so if you were to bury that you're suddenly changing what's between the wires from air to dirt and you're affecting it so only coax is insulated enough and appropriate to be buried ladder line is not now how good is your antenna that's gain. Now, gain is a term often used for amplifiers, how much it can amplify. Uh, one antenna versus another will, relative to the receiver, generate gain. Because at a receiver that's far away, if you've got a good antenna, maybe a directional antenna, switching from one to the other will result in that receiving device seeing two times, three times the power. This is not an exaggeration. And so the antenna, how, it, how well it transmits the signal, is referred to as gain. When comparing two antenna, it's, or when the manufacturers are giving a rating, uh, it's generally based on a comparison to a theoretical point antenna. So just a marble or something. And that's called an isotropic antenna. So the signal strength improvement, the gain, is based on what we see at a receiving point, which is a receiver. So if I was to take an isotropic antenna test, see what level of signal I'm receiving, uh, you know, whatever distance away, and then I switch to another antenna, how much better is it now coming in? That's the gain. The signal strength improvement at the receiving point is measured with an S meter, which is part of most radios. And the S meter generally goes one to nine and then plus plus above that. Uh, a power increase of four times is an S meter increase of one. So gain is measured based on the ratio. It's not an absolute value. It's based on how much improvement you're seeing. And it's measured in dB. There are some mass slides we're not going to bother with too much. If we double our power, we call it a 3 dB gain increase. Okay? I say try the math, don't worry about it. Doubling power is a 3 dB gain increase. Okay? Now, example. So I change from an isotropic antenna to a Yagi with those elements of the Yagi nicely pointing at the receiver, okay, that receiver will see an improvement. If another receiver was on the side of the Yagi or behind the Yagi, it's not going to see an improvement. Okay. Now, if our reference is 8 dB, doubling our power adds 3 dB. Remember, 3 dB increase means doubling power. So if a test question says we're at 8 dB and we double the power, what are we now going to measure? 11 dB. If we stack two Yagis together, that doubles our power. So it adds another 3. So for the calculation at the bottom there, remember we're starting at 8. We're adding a first Yagi that doubles our power, or doubles our gain, so we're at 11. We stack two Yagis, so we're doubling it again. We're at 14 dB. Top things to remember for the test after going through all these slides. Most antenna are half wavelength for the test. The exceptions, the quad and the delta, where the four sides of the quad or the three sides of the delta add up their length and you get a full wavelength. Only coax can be buried. You can't bury ladder line. The antenna has got to be high enough that it can't be touched. You don't want to be cooking any meat sack that wanders by. And the most vulnerable part, remember, is your eyeballs. Impedances, if you have different impedances, you have to match them up with a transformer. If you're connecting balanced and unbalanced cables, you need a balen. SWR is how well power is transmitted to the antenna. 
SWR is a ratio of transmitted to reflected voltage. It's measured by a bridge, which is another word for a meter, and you have an antenna tuner to dissipate the reflected power. Always test first with a dummy load. And if you double the power, the gain is increased by 3 dB. Now go on, take quizzes number 9 and number 17. They're moderately difficult. We do recommend you take these, even though they're difficult, until you get 90 to 95 percent accuracy, because it's all really good, serious info you want to remember. Some of the other tests, like components and things like that, uh, are not going to be of much value to you, but this antenna stuff is really important. Uh, repeat the tests at least three times to help you remember everything, and you may want to repeat these slides or this video between taking 9 and 17. Again, we're YLab at https colon slash slash ylab.ca, and uh, all the links are in the comments below. Good luck on tests 9 and 17.